Thank you, everyone. This one. Yes. Dean Neroman, Dr. Blodgett, Dr. Ferguson, faculty of the University of Houston, members of the Advisory Council, and students. It's a great honor for me to be here today and to have the opportunity to address you. I immigrated to the United States 22 years ago, and at the first interview I went to get a job, I was told, you don't know a damn thing. The reason I was told this was because I was not educated in America, I did not have work experience in America, and according to the interviewer, what could I possibly know? But I had come here for the American dream. The American dream that promises everybody a chance, wherever you come from and whoever you are. I believe that in America, you can begin with nothing and can achieve everything through hard work and perseverance. That failure to get a decent job led me to start my own business. It is of course a dangerous strategy since we all know that 90% of new businesses fail. But at the same time, I had nothing, so I really had nothing to lose. So every failure is an opportunity to make a change. You've just got to find what it is. When I first came to Houston, I did not know a single person. My first point of entry in the country was New York. In those days before the internet, it was difficult to find out about other cities. So I called up the local newspapers of about 10 cities, including Dallas, Los Angeles, Miami, New Orleans, and so on, and asked them to send me their weekend newspapers. We had to buy them, about three or four dollars each. From this, I was able to get the pulse of the city. Business, housing, restaurants, cost of living, crime, etc. I knew that I wanted to start a company doing international business. So Houston, with its international port and airport, was a good fit. I decided to start my company and called it Equator Corporation. It was an import-export company for moving products between America and Europe, Africa, and Asia. My first office was at the Arena Tower on Highway 59, not too far from here. Houston at that time was recovering from the oil bust of the 80s and there was a lot of surplus office space available. I was able to negotiate a three-year lease with no deposit and no rent to be paid for the, for the first six months with payments gradually increasing after that. I still remember my first day in office. April 1st, 1991. April Fool's Day. <laughs> I didn't know this, but at that time, but starting and sustaining a business would be no joke. <laughs> it would be the most serious thing I would be doing for the rest of my life. My office was well laid out with a desk, sofa, coffee maker, copy machine, even a silk rug. My first visitor came for a meeting at 10 a.m. He asked me how long I had been in that office. I said, not long at all. <laughs> and this is what he told me. This is a beautiful office you have set up, but what are you doing here? To get business, you have to get out and hustle. I started my import-export business, and I was, breaking, I was breaking even within a year, but I was searching for a product that was more tangible. At the time, I was staying in an apartment. I was young, with a little child, and I told my wife every Sunday, let's go to Galveston, let's go and enjoy ourselves at the beach. And she would say, I can't do that. There's too much laundry to do. I'm sure many of you have used these machines. You go to the coin-op machine, you load your clothes in the washer, you go back in 30 or 40 minutes, to transfer the clothes to the to, from the washer to the dryer, then you go back after an hour to remove the clothes from the dryer, and if you get late for some reason, you may find your clothes tossed out or even missing. I told my wife, why don't we get a combo washer dryer like the one we had in our apartment in London? A combo washer dryer, which you see on the right, 
is a one single machine that both washes and dries your clothes without any transfer from washer to the dryer. So off we went to Montgomery Wards and Sears and looked for this machine. The salespeople looked at us incredulously and said that no such machine existed in the country. This piqued my interest, so I started doing some research on combo washer dryers. Now mind you, I'm not an engineer, I'm a business graduate, like all of you, and so this was quite a far stretch to understand the engineering aspects of this. So I, and I found that no one was making these over here. So I went to Europe and talked to different manufacturers about what it would entail to do something like this. I finally found a plant in Italy who said that they had the technology to make this to US specifications, voltage, energy requirements, safety, and so on. They asked if I had the funds to bankroll the business. And I said, of course I do. <laughs> Always show that you're positive, even if you aren't. The plant in Italy finally sent me a prototype, and after some tests and due diligence, I was ready with the product. One of my potential customers was a rent-to-owned company called Remco. I offered to make the product for them and to earn a commission of 5 to 7 percent. But, but the buyer said no. He asked, who would be responsible for the service, parts, and warranty? But he said if I could bring the product in and carry some inventory and take care of all these requirements, he would try them out and give me a chance. I asked him what brand did he want on the machine. He said since it was a new concept, any name would do. What about Equator? I went to many banks to get financing, but was not able to get any funds. They asked me for things like credit history, collateral, and a bunch of ratios. I didn't have any of them. In fact, I had just got my social security card. So now I had to figure out how to fund the project. By then I had built up a stack of credit cards. I went to the bank and cashed these out and wired the money to the plant in Italy. My first container was now in production and I was committed. So be committed. Don't look for an exit plan. It's too easy to cut and run. The container arrived in a couple of months and I started to sell these to my first customer. I thought, this is the most wonderful product since sliced bread. And the customers would line up to buy it. This great combo washer dryer that had the ability to change people's lives and free up their time. But no one came. People were skeptical about the concept, how it worked, about front-loading machines, and in general, whether they leaked, uh, how, it, how long it would take, and so on. I decided to go on a press campaign. I started issuing press releases nationally in major metropolitan cities. The day it was published in the local paper, we would have customers calling us to get more information. We asked the customer, who is the best of, who is the best appliance dealer in your city? We then called the dealer and told them about our product and what, and we had customers lined up to buy the product if he decided to buy it. In this way, we were featured in major national papers including the Houston Chronicle, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and magazines like Fortune, Business Week, Popular Mechanics, Popular Science, and so on. We even got on the Oprah show. The strategy worked. Customers called, we gained credibility, and we made sales. In this way, we built up a national dealer database. Based on the success of the strategy, I still believe in this maxim. The only reason for any publicity, including advertising, is to sell. Keep a clear head, keep your ego in check, and don't ever mistake that this is about you. It's for the product. So I built up the company over the next 10 years, over the, from 1992 to 2002, and we were known as the company that specialized in European products. We had combos from Italy, dishwashers from Spain and from Greece, refrigerators from Denmark and Germany, and food warmers from UK. Everything looked rosy and business was expanding steadily. We had distribution centers in eight places around the country. Houston, Seattle, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Miami, Atlanta, and 
mile in Toronto. We did this in order to be close to our customers. Shipping costs were very high. It cost us $25 to ship a machine from overseas to the U.S., but $100 to ship it from point A to point B in the U.S. domestically. However, the operations were unruly, and we kept having issues regarding shipping, damage, repairs, etc., and most importantly, having the inventory in the wrong place. No one was able to forecast exactly which customer needed machines from which distribution center. As business students, these are probably things that you will come across as you go along. So I thought that perhaps we needed to consolidate our operations and decided to build our centralized global headquarters and distribution center in Houston. We picked a great location on Beltway 8, bought the land, got a top architect to design the building. The building would be reflective of our business and the countries we did business with. We called it Equator Plaza. A 60,000 square foot building with Doric columns borrowed from the Parthenon in Athens, Greece, skylights to let the light and the sun in, which was inspired from the churches of Italy. The building was painted metallic silver, symbolic of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. The roof was shaped like the sacred door of the Buddha temple in Sanchi, India. We moved into our building. Things looked good. We had about 2,000 dealers around the country. Business was rocking and rolling. We were making good profits, and we thought we were the cat's meow. <clears throat> but, unknown to us, there was trouble on the horizon. The seeds for this were sown in the formation of the European Union. In this, the European countries would unite their separate currencies into one currency called the Euro. The northern European countries like Germany and France were stronger and favored the euro so they could expand their industrial markets. The southern European countries also favored this as it would give them access to manufacturing technology from the more industrial north as well as expand agricultural markets. However, it did not quite work out that way. The northern European countries quickly dominated the eurozone economy and put a lot of pressure on the southern countries like Italy, Spain, and Greece. Some of those effects you're still seeing now. The euro at that time, which started off at 0.8 to $1, gained strength and was soon at $1.5 to $1. This almost doubled our cost and was not sustainable. American consumers did not care about the volatility of the euro and wanted to buy at a stable price. Into this combustible mix came China. China was promoting itself as a manufacturing hub and had pegged its currency, the yuan, also called the renminbi, to the U.S. dollar. At the time, it was 8.3 yuan to one dollar. It became easier to do business in China with the stability of a fixed exchange rate. In fact, doing business with China was almost as simple as doing business with California. The pressure on European companies was unbearable and this started resulting in the closure of many companies. It was a shame that great companies with strong engineering histories just crumpled, including many of the plants we did business with. It was an example of creative destruction, all production segments being rendered obsolete. Our main supplier of combo washer dryers from Italy was a small company, and they too found the going difficult. They decided to sell out to the number three player in Europe, a $5 billion company. I got the notice one fine day that this was happening. A new company renamed our supplier as Plant Number 23 and fired all the engineers. They changed the manufacturing processes and, sh and started shipping us the new model combos. We did not know that the new machines had a fatal flaw. In order to save 30 cents because of the financial pressures, the new engineers had cut out a surge protector in the main electronic module of the machine. This would cause the electronics to fry under certain conditions. We started getting bombarded with customer calls. The machines were malfunctioning and some were catching fire. We sent out repair modules and these burnt out as well. Some customers even returned product to their dealer store. In addition, some customers complained to the Better Business Bureau, the Attorney General's office, and we finally got notice that we were under investigation by the Consumer Product Safety I'm explaining these so you know the history. There are ups and downs in every company. 
When I heard about the problems that Toyota had a few years ago with their brake problems and their recall, I could empathize with their situation. I had been in exactly the same situation, just that the numbers were different. I'm showing the screen because that's what I was doing internally. It's a very famous painting that sold for many millions of dollars very recently. From this I learned that something that happens in another part of the world can affect you. You cannot be complacent. You have to have one eye open all the time. Particularly as new graduates going into the international field, it's important to you just don't know, but this is one implication of what happened. Anyway, to resolve the problem, we took a two-pronged approach. First, we would take care of each and every customer and dealer in order to keep them satisfied. This meant shipping free replacement parts or free machines, or in some cases, even crediting the customer for the purchase price. Second, we would take up the issue with the Italian plant and file a claim. To our surprise, the plant said it was not their problem. And since they had sold us the product FOV Italy, they had no further liability. Very coincidentally, they also informed me that they would be entering the US to market under their own brand. Their plan would be to go on to target our, our customers and distributors. All of a sudden, our supplier has had become our competitor. Many people to this day feel that our supplier supplied us effective product to run us out of the market. We decided to file a lawsuit against the Italian company. It was like David versus Goliath. Since they were based overseas, the first problem would be where to serve them the legal papers. Since by now I knew they would be exhibiting at the same kitchen and bath show in Las Vegas where we were also exhibiting, I carried the lawsuit papers with me. On the opening day of the show, I walked over to their booth and handed over the documents to my old account manager and asked him to sign the receipt. Being a $5 billion company, they reacted with alarm and hired the top law firm in Houston, Fulbright and Jaworski. My attorney was an independent guy operating in a small office. It was a landmark case with international implications. On one hand, you had a plant that made product with their basic technology, but with our branding. They claimed that they sold products to about 100 countries around the world. How could products only really have problems in the U.S.? Fulbright's attorney visited our office and we showed him the thousands of burned out machines. He told his client that they had done us wrong and this is not the way to do business. The settlement in our favor helped us take care of customer claims, service bills and repair some of the brand equity that had been damaged. You must fight for what you believe is right. No one will feel sorry for you when things go wrong. I now decided that enough was enough. From now on, I would control my own destiny. I already had the means of distribution, but now I wanted to control the means of manufacture. I had depended on others to make my products, and this is how I got burnt lithium. I decided to make a fresh start in China. I flew there for a trade show and met some manufacturers. I offered to visit them and decided to set up a joint venture called Mei Ling, one of the top companies in the country. The land was purchased, buildings erected, and production started. These are some of the pictures of the building. We also decided to start a back office in India that time uh, to carry out our service and support and our level two customer service operation that carried out in a city called Pune. By 2007, most of our products were being made in China and the closest port of entry was Los Angeles. From there, the containers would be put on a train and shipped by rail to Houston. This doubled the cost of shipping and also increased the time by two weeks. If we use the Panama Canal route, it would cost less but take even more time. Now our headquarter building and distribution center was becoming an expensive overhead. I decided that we should sell the building and set up new facilities in Los Angeles and New York. 
the closest ocean points of entry from China and Europe. Since the last few years, the competition in our field has been increasing. Having pioneered the market category called combo washer dryers, we found ourselves facing competition from giant multinationals like LG, Hire, and our old suppliers from Italy and many more. Even though we now had multiple brands for different market segments, we had lost market share and I was looking for a comeback. The same technology had been in production with only minor incremental changes for many years. I decided to refresh myself and spend longer time in the, in the plant in China. Why China? I believe that China is the only place in the world right now that has the mix of engineers, plant capability, labor cost, component suppliers, and the ability to comply with the requirements of the U.S. for packaging, safety, energy compliance, and so on. And I believe this will be true for, for at least the next 10 years. As a product developer, you need the cooperation of a number of people, none as important as the engineers. Most engineers are programmed to say that it cannot be done. But I'm lucky that I have a group of engineers I work with who said yes, that they could do what I would ask of them. I made a list of all the improvements I wanted based on our customer feedback. Some of these were, were enhancements containing multiple operations. Some of these features had never been done before. I was called to China a few months later to review the product. And after a few tweaks, we were ready to go. Our new machine is called the Super Combo and it was just rolled out a few months ago. It's the most advanced combination wash and dryer in the world with multiple features including two different kinds of uh, condense, of, of grind, venting and condensing. In addition, we have fans that you can exhaust the air to 50 feet or even 100 feet, uh, critical for older buildings and so on. This is causing waves and we've already been accepted into Sears, Best Buy, Costco, Sam's Club and many other stores. We also sell our products to the recreational vehicle and the marine markets under our pinnacle brand. We will also be expanding in Europe and the Middle East and also introducing sales in East Eastern Europe, which by the way is being spearheaded by a next student of the college called Bosco Kaljik. We also have plans for South Africa and India in 2014. Electrolux, the largest appliance company in the world, has asked us to sample and test our machines. They would be interested in selling it under their branding. It will be quite a role reversal from where we started off. We will now be the manufacturer, making for others their branding. We're also planning to set up a, set up a plant in Fort Worth sometime in the next year or two with, a, with another proprietary design called the Cobra Hybrid. How do you sell? People ask me that question. I met a lady recently at a trade show and she said that she did not want to sell. She was sitting alone and I went and talked to her. She's, I asked her what she did and she told me she owned a hair salon but she was there with her husband and accompanying him and she, she really didn't want to get involved in what he was doing. So I told her about our super combo and how it worked and we were also trying to sell our machines to hair salons. She jumped up and said she would love to help me do that. I told her that I was now confused since just a few minutes ago she had told me that she did not like to sell. <laughs> From this I can conclude the following. One, in order to sell you must love the product or service you are selling. And I know love, many of you are being recruited and I think this is a tie-in with the recruiters uh, also to have it two ways. You must love the product or service. Second, you must have the patience to listen. This, which means to say if you're selling a product, you must have the patience to listen. Many times I go to a meeting and my sales rep is doing all the talking to the buyer and the buyer is listening and the buyer is, uh, is trying to say something and the sales rep is just talking a lot and I put my hand up and I say, wait, I want to listen to what the other person is saying. And the buyer tells me his concern I understand what he's trying to say, and in most, in most cases it's quite reasonable and quite simple. Number three, the customer is always right. When I make a presentation to a large company like Sears or Best Buy, I have to sign a 100-page 
compliance agreement. I'm not going to sit there and negotiate. They're a hundred billion dollar company. I have no right to negotiate. They've already been through their lawyers and they, they know what they want. I go straight to the last page and I sign it. I don't even read it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And I give it to my people in my team and say, read the hundred pages. And that's a comply. There's no negotiation. That's it. It's very simple to sell. I, just as an aside, I used, I, when I started doing business in China, I sent, there were agreements, and uh, I sent this to my attorney, and he called, he said, it was nuts, how could I ever sign an agreement like this? I said, I'm going to China, I'm signing an agreement, there's no way I'm going to negotiate, what, and this is the same thing that GM and uh, GE and so on, they go with a plain load of lawyers, you can't win if the other party doesn't want you to has to be a meeting of minds. So how do you build relationships? I build relationships by connecting to the other party in multiple ways. And I'm saying this because one of the points was pointed out about uh, coming from, uh, from an international background and being a non, let's uh, say being a minority here in the US. And so I'll tell you how I do it. I build relationships in multiple ways. One simple way is to put yourself in the other party's hands. When I travel, I ask my counterparts on the other side to do my hotel bookings. And this is whether in the US or even overseas. They're only too happy to oblige. They know the local hotels, their favorite eating places. They know they are responsible for my pickup and drop off and so on. My fate is in their hands and they get the feeling of responsibility for me. Someone once asked me, well, if you do that, what happens to all your points? I'd like to stay. I have my favorite Hilton and Marriott, and I have a lot of points. But by doing it this way, I don't get my points. I told him, I don't care about the points. I was interested in the relationship. And this is, this, this is the lesson from here. Stay focused on what you really want. Do you want the points or do you want the relationship? In my case, I want the relationship to work, and I spend a great deal of time on relationship management. If the relationship is strong, the business has a good chance of working. Business is difficult as it is. It is easy to have a good relationship when the business is smooth, but when the going gets choppy, it is the relationship that will get you out of trouble. People have to know you and believe in you as a person. We all play different roles and we are different in our official role and as an individual. I make it a point to invite business people to my home so they can meet my family and know about me. I cook for them over a barbecue and they get to know me as a person. I find it gives them confidence about me and my values. How hard do I work? One would think that if I'm a president of a company, I have a lot of people to do for my work. But no, I work 24-7. I stop for meals, sleep, family, and sport. Our suppliers overseas are working around the clock in different time zones. I send an email, I get a response in four hours. Our company operates the same way. There is no excuse to reply, to not reply to someone promptly. In fact, in our company, we have a rule that we must reply to a customer the same day. We also follow the one-stop strategy. When a customer calls, we do not treat him, him or her like a soccer ball and kick him to someone else in the company. We have customer relation managers. The same person takes care of the customer and is a one-point contact for sales, reorders, parts, customer service, and also collections. There is accountability and responsibility by each person. Of course, you can imagine they have to be very well rounded in order to be able to perform multiple tasks of this. <clears throat> Today is Pearl Harbor Day. Perhaps you are all aware of the historical significance of this day. It is not because 3,600 Americans were killed or injured the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. In fact, there were more than one million U.S. casualties in World War II. It is because the Japanese attacked the U.S. in Pearl Harbor 
without issuing a formal declaration of war. In War II, there is a code of conduct which must be followed, and for whatever reason, the declaration of war by the Japanese imperial government was not received in time. For this reason, President Franklin Roosevelt complained, proclaimed December 7, 1941, as a date which will live in infamy. It was considered to be not fair play. As in war, so too in business. There is a code of conduct which binds us. No one objects if you make money the hard-earned way. That, that is, by buying or making a product or service and selling it for a profit. This is the fundamental of any business and applies to entrepreneurs like me and also to large corporations. However, in the last few years, the reputation of business has been damaged due to the outright dishonesty of people who have skimmed the system for their greed. It used to be that people were more interested doing the best they could in making a product or service. The reward was only a byproduct. Nowadays it seems that making of money has become a goal in of itself. Here is a list of, here is the result of a Gallup poll listing different professions as regards ethics and honesty. On the left you will see the most trusted professions on the right, the least trusted profession position, and you can see business executives is the least trusted, even more than attorneys and car salespeople. I'm in the business field like you. For all of you getting your MBA on the cusp of going into the world, it is a sobering thought to know where your profession, where your profession stands. But you. We have a chance to change that perception. <coughs> Even the Japanese have been able to redeem themselves, judging by our love of automobiles and electronics. As you go forward, I hope you will remember that you must be fair and ethical in the treatment of all those who come in, who you come, who come in contact with, your employees, your superiors, your customers, your vendors, your financiers, and so on. There should be a feeling of fair play. Too often, in the business world, we are governed by the making of profits, cutting off losses, meeting Wall Street expectations. It's dog eat dog. When one takes shortcuts and does it at the expense of someone else, it is dishonesty and it creates negative feedback, in addition to the taking of livelihoods of innocent people. When have we last heard about what is right or wrong. It's always that we have complied with the law. It is time to change that and to have the business profession gain more respect. The art of creating something out of nothing and the making of profit is noble. It creates jobs and contributes to the economic cycle and is something to be proud of. It's not about money. It's about making the best product or service. It's standing behind what you do. It's about being the best you can be for your customers. At the end of the day, my first interview was right. I still don't know a damn thing. If you see what Socrates said, to know is to know that you know nothing. That is the meaning of true knowledge. We are always constantly learning and trying to get the best possible outcome for a situation. I know now that I have reached close to the halfway point of my business career and I hope some of these lessons I have learned will help you along your journey. I wish you all the very best for yourselves and to accomplish all that you can in this life. Thank you very much.